Well, how about we begin our journey into the tasks and overview of working with all the various tasks with a look at the containers. So I thought what we'll do is, as I mentioned in the last video, we'll break it down. We'll do the containers first, and then we'll jump into the tasks. I think, uh, you know, the first thing to do is just take a look at which container objects there are. So if you want to follow at home, you're welcome to do so. However, let me just go ahead and tell you, these next maybe two or three videos are not going to be like super exciting, challenging things that I'm doing to teach you a specific skill necessarily. These next couple of videos are really more, here's what they are, here's what they do, now let's move on and talk about using them in the real world. So you can think of this video and the next one more along the lines of uh, a precursor to being able to effectively work with something. So I'm not going to include the attached SSIS uh, packages uh, that I build in here because they're not really meant for you to do. They're just really meant for you to kind of watch and just go, oh, I get it. That makes sense now. So enough chatter let's just create a new project here and it doesn't matter what we create as long as it's an integration services project and we're really going to focus over here on huh, strange uh, on the left hand side you see these three here the for loop the for each loop and the sequence container that's what we're going to talk about in this uh, three four five video uh, set here on working with the containers here so I'm going to walk through each of them and give you examples of using them. We'll also talk about the fourth container that's not listed here in this list, but that is available to you in the designer here. So let's just take a look at, uh, first off, what each of these are and when you might use each one. So what I'm going to do is just pull up a little document here that we can use here. And let's just take a look at the for loop container. So let's just have one little page here that we can use to come up with a quick little one sentence summary of each one of these. Now the for loop container is when you have a specific set of iteration that you want to go through and you want a certain number of tasks to execute a certain number of times. So uh, it's similar to any for loop uh, to where you might do something like uh, for int i equals 0, i uh, less than 100, i plus plus, I guess I should put them right here, and you know, do something important, and close here. So uh, this is a C sharp based for loop in case you're not familiar with the syntax here it's just doing nothing but a looping construct an iteration we start at zero it's really going to iterate 100 times through this particular for loop right not a whole lot of difficulty maybe if you're a t sequel person uh, you'd prefer something like declare i int equals zero. Okay, so this is the new SQL 2008 syntax where you can uh, assign the value of a variable on the same line as declaring it. And you could, there's a couple of different ways. Uh, we could just say while at i is less than 100, uh, print i is less than 100, set at i, and I'm just going to use the older style syntax here, uh, and then n. So this would be a more declarative syntax than the C-sharp style that you see there, but it's just iteration, right? That's all that you're going to be doing. You have, you know, you might have, I don't know, maybe I, I, what I've used this for is when I was denormalizing an Excel spreadsheet, and I didn't know how many columns there were going to be. So I would receive the Excel spreadsheet, I would have to count up how many columns there were, and then I would have a for loop that for every column in the Excel spreadsheet, it would execute that many times. So if you know there were 12 columns, the for loop was going to execute 12 times to denormalize 12 columns worth of data. 
So it can be assigned at runtime. You can know what this value is prior to execution. It's just your straight up for loop, okay? And as we get into developing more complex packages, things with variables, for example, then we'll be able to work more visually with the for loop container. It's kind of hard to do it, though, unless you really have a lot of variables. There's just not a lot you can really explain. It's just pure iteration, okay? So that's a for loop container. Now, a for each loop container, see, I'm going to quickly uh, run out of paper. So if you want to keep that, uh, take yourself a screenshot because uh, I'm going to make a new piece of paper here. Uh, so if we said that the for loop container was same as a programming for loop, right? then the for each loop container is very also very similar but it's for each item in a collection executes a set of tasks okay and it could be one task or multiple tasks here now the most common example of something like this is for every file in a folder I want to load it up into a SQL server now, this is actually a pretty common technique that we use. Uh, we download something from FTP, and then however many files there are in that folder, I want to load that into my SQL Server. Very common. You're given a collection. That collection, in this case, was your uh, files in a folder. And then for every item in the collection, you want to execute a task. You know, this is also common for database results for every row that comes back from a select statement, I want to execute a set of tasks. Uh, let's see, the sequence container, uh, this just simply allows you to group tasks together and have them execute in a defined sequence. So uh, you will use this used with precedence constraints. Okay, and if you're not familiar with precedence constraints, this is, you know, how you right click on one task and then you drag the little arrow to another task and then you say, I want this next task to execute after this one or when it was successful or when the previous one had failed. Those are technically called precedence constraints. Don't worry if you're not totally clear on that. I've got pretty early on here, maybe three videos from now, a video, a couple of videos specifically just about what are precedence constraints, how can I work with those in my packages here. So a sequence container, it's, it's not going to do anything on an iterative basis. So it's only going to get executed once, unlike the for loop or the for each loop. It's just strictly there to group things together and then say, hey, this is one group, and I want to assign a precedence constraint prior to or after this group of tasks. Now, the next one that we're going to see, and the one that's not visual, is just strictly a group. A group and a sequence container, very similar. You're just grouping them together so that you can collapse or expand the group and just makes it easier to manage things inside of SSIS. Okay, so I'm about to wipe this away. So if you're really interested in what I wrote right there, then you can go ahead and take a screen capture of this particular page. I think it's altogether 25 words, so I think you could type it in as well if you were so inclined. Ready? I'm about to wipe it away. One. Two, oops, did it too fast. <laughs> All right, so this was great about video. You can go rewind it. All right, anyway, so you have the basic ideas of what the types of containers are, right? Here's, you can see them here, the for loop, the sequence, the, uh, oops, should have put it up here, uh, and our sequence container, right?